Welcome to the AI Hardware Show. I'm Sally Ward-Foxton with the e Times. I'm joined by in industry analyst extraordinaire, Dr. Ian Cutras. This episode, we've got some very exciting wafer scale chips and some very exciting edge chips also for you. You mean edge can be exciting? Edge is very exciting. Please stop. <laughs> Many thanks to Unteva AI for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in the latest in high performance and high efficiency AI hardware, then stay tuned for more information later this show. So first up, let's talk Cerebrus's wafer scale engine. Now Cerebrus shocked the world when it was first announced. A machine learning processor, the size of a single wafer, as big as your head with an effective 100% yield, introduced new packaging, gigabytes of local memory, across hundreds of thousands of cores. This is what gives the WaveScale engine a unique position in the industry. Now the current generation is WaveScale Engine 2, built on TSMC 7 nanometer, and it costs a few million each, or at least we think so. They won't actually tell us how much it costs. I'm pretty sure arm, leg, and newborn is where you have to begin when you start negotiating. So Cerebrus are heralding Defense, Pharma, and HPC as customers, but they're not only using it just for machine learning, there's also stencil compute in there as well. Very nice research papers I highly recommend. Customers can buy a single system or network up to 192 of them together to train networks with over 10 trillion parameters. Cerebrus, as we're filming this, even recently announced a 16 system Andromeda supercomputer that you can get access to, you know, if you've got the right money and checkbook. But having such a large chip means saving latency compared to lots of small chips joined together, such as GPUs, and Cerebrus will happily tell you all about it. Cerebrus recently demonstrated the benefits of having such a large chip with a customer training their language network on a single chip at 10x the speed for 1 20th of the cost that it would be to run across multiple GPUs. To date, Cerebrus has secured over $700 million in funding and he's looking at next generation process nodes for that third generation wave scale engine. You know, Andrew, I'm gonna to have to ask for a taste. Now, Sally, tell us about a chip that no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs> Mythic is not the only company working on analog, analog compute, but it's probably the best known having been around for 10 years until earlier this month when the company closed its doors. It seems like they ran out of funding. Analog compute, sometimes called compute in memory, has been around for decades, but it's come back into focus more recently now that AI has taken off. Analog compute uses memory to perform the computation. Specifically, it can do large amounts of Mac operations needed for matrix multiplication at very low power. What happens is you program your array of memory cells, in Mythic's case it was flash transistors, with the weights of the neural network. Mythic can store an 8-bit integer weight in a single flash transistor. Then you convert your data to an analog voltage, and the flash transistors act as resistors. The resistance is dependent on whatever weights you programmed in. The voltage on the other side of the resistor gives you the multiplication part, and then you connect all the wires together and read the current, and that gives you the addition part. Then convert back to the digital domain. Because all the weights are already stored in the memory, you don't have to go back and forth to an external memory, so you can save a lot of power. Mythics IP is partly in the calibration and compensation algorithms that it needs to cancel out noise so it can do reliable computation. The company had built a 25 TOPS accelerator that operated in a 3 watt power envelope on an M.2 key card, which it was intending to sell into industrial machine vision, video analytics and security cameras, drones and body pose estimation in AR and VR systems. And just a word to anyone out there, if you have a mythic IPU now that the company's failed, please send it on over. It's a collector's item. I really want one. So next up on my list is Tesla Dojo. Tesla Dojo is essentially the competitor that's not really a competitor to Cerebrus's wafer scale engine. I have a couple of videos out on this, but essentially Dojo is one chip that they put 25 of on a wafer. They put 120 wafers together in what they call a Dojo supercomputer. There is six different pieces of custom silicon here. You've got the chip, you've got the wafer, 
You've got the uh, interface processor, of which there are 10 per wafer. You've got the interface cards, you've got the switches, and there's probably something special somewhere else online. I was lucky enough to go to Tesla AI Day, where they showcase the latest updates for this. And the whole point about this computer, uh, according to Elon at least anyway, they need a way to be able to replace the GPUs in the data center in order to scale up their workload. Right now, it seems their biggest workload uh, on the self-driving side isn't actually training the self-driving algorithm, but labeling the video that it comes in. Now, data labeling is a key part of machine learning. If you want uh, supervised learning of your data, you need to be able to label that data. And uh, what Tesla do here is they actually use AI or machine learning to label their data for training their self-driving AI. Uh, this right now on GPUs for about a 30 second video takes six hours. So trying to do that faster and more efficiently, consuming less power and having an advantage over all the competition are key elements here in Tesla's wheelhouse. Now, currently the system is still being tested and brought up to brought up speed. Uh, we're expecting to see seven full 120 Tesla Dojo AI supercomputers in Palo Alto by probably the end of next year. And something, uh, end of next year, uh, I'm currently talking to you in 2022. If this is 2023, it's the end of 23. Uh, but we expect to see more information about Tesla Dojo at next year's AI day. Fingers crossed I get an invite again. Uh, but e Elon and the team have said this is a multi-generational product, uh, but it only works if they can turn the GPUs off. And now a word from today's sponsor, somebody you know and love. And this episode is sponsored by Untether AI. Untether AI is at the forefront of energy-centric AI acceleration by providing ultra-efficient, high-performance AI chips, enabling new frontiers in AI applications. By combining the power efficiency of at-memory computation with the robustness of digital processing, Untether AI has developed a groundbreaking new chip architecture for neural net inference that eliminates the data movement bottleneck that costs energy and performance in traditional architectures. Visit www.untether.ai to learn more. Links are in the video description. What's the highest number of cores you've ever seen on a chip? Untether's data center chip has 1,400 RISC-V cores on the same piece of silicon. The Canadian startup's most recent chip, SpeedAI, is based on its second-gen architecture, Bulkaria. It's a data center inference accelerator capable of two petaflops of FP8 performance running at peak power consumption, which is 66 watts, or 30 terafl teraflops per watt based on a more usual 30 to 35 watt power envelope. This translates to BERT inference at 750 queries per second per watt, which the company says is 15x the performance of a state-of-the-art GPU. The company calls its architecture at memory compute, in which memory banks contain multi-thread RISC-V processors in an array configuration. In the previous version of the architecture, processing elements in each memory bank were controlled by a single controller. There's now a controller on each row. This reduction in granularity increases efficiency since different instructions can be processed within the same memory bank. There's still the interconnect Untether calls the rotator cuff, which rotates activations between the processing elements to save energy. There's also zero detect circuitry and hardware support for two to one sparsity. Untether's added more than 20 custom instructions to its RISC V cores for things like matrix vector multiplication and row reduce functions. Untether uses two FP8 formats designed to balance efficiency, throughput, and accuracy. Untether says this is a sweet spot that results in less than 0.1 percentage points of accuracy loss compared to BF16, but it's four times more energy efficient. SpeedAI comes on M.2 modules or on a six-chip PCIe card that can do 12 petaflops. Untether's roadmap also has smaller chips based on the same architecture for things like infrastructure, autonomous vehicles, and a sub-1 watt chip for battery-operated devices. The company's already working with General Motors on AV perception systems. So the next chip on my list is Tachyon Prodigy. Now, before you complain, and say, what the hell is Tachyon, and why is it on this list? I want to point out that we initially heard about Tachyon in 2018. They introduced an architecture in 2018 that promised the world, and no one believed it. Well, it turns out, neither did Tachyon, because in 2022, that architecture changed to something a bit more reasonable that we've seen similar before. Rather than the VLIW architecture in the previous design, this one looks more like a regular core, something in between ARM and x86, 
with fixed le length instructions, but in two different modes rather than, say, variable length in x86. Now, the key here is that Tachium is going to provide 128 cores on a chip, and each core has two 1024-bit two vector units, kind of like AVX 1024, but two of them. Now, we all know what Intel chips currently do with the AV AVX 512, but imagine having two lots of AVX 1024, 128 cores. What frequency do you think that runs at? Tachium here is claiming 5.7 gigahertz at the high end with 12 channels of DDR5 7200. Pull that together and you have a 900 watt chip. Now that's technically in HPC mode. There are gonna be uh, other, other uh, chips further down with lower power. And on this chip, it's gonna be built, said for HPC, but also for AI. Having that much memory bandwidth, DDR5 7200 12 channel is almost one terabyte second of bandwidth. That's going to be very important for a lot of AI workloads where you're hitting the memory limit in that roofline model. That being said, we're not sure exactly when this chip is going to come out. Tachium is in the process of, uh, of building it out. They already have FPGA systems for testing for its customers. They're also going through some legal issues based on some of their IP suppliers of that 2018 design. But things are moving forward. And it's important to point out that the head of Tachium Dr. Radoslav Danilak is proven in high-speed performance architectures. He built Sandforce up from the ground when SSD controllers were still very terrible and defined that market. He's worked at NVIDIA. He's built 10 gigahertz DSPs. So high frequency is in his ballpark. And the reason why I'm more confident than I used to be about this design is A, I've gone through, with, through it with him, but also B, of who he is. Very headstrong and knows what he's doing. When we're going to see a Tachium chip, again, don't really know at this point, hopefully by the end of 2023. Uh, and with these, some of these performance numbers, you've got to hope it can deliver what it's promising. Which British audio processing company spun out Graphcore in order to focus on Edge AI? The answer is Exmos. Exmos was founded in Bristol in 2005. They have an unusual core architecture with software-defined DSP and I.O. capabilities, which was initially for audio processing. As the vision shifted towards AI, the company incubated Graphcore for two years before spinning it out to focus on server-side AI and retained its focus on Edge AI. The X-Cores architecture is built on building blocks called logical cores, which can be used for either I.O., DSP, control functions, or AI acceleration. There may be 8 to 32 logical cores in each chip, and designers can choose how many cores to allocate to each function. Each tile also contains memory, ALUs, and a vector unit, which the logical cores share. Different functions are mapped to the different cores in firmware, so you effectively get a software-defined SOC. Some of the cores can be allocated to the AI workload, where some can do tasks that would normally be done in software. This helps when requirements change and more features need to be added during development. The company says it's quicker to bring IoT devices to market, and because of the flexibility, it makes smaller markets much more economical. Chips in the X-Core family are built as crossover processors with the flexibility of an application processor, but the low power and real-time operation of a microcontroller. They can handle 32-bit down to 1-bit integers and will be used in the AIoT. Initially, voice applications like audio interfaces, but parts in this family can handle networks like person detection, person ID, and many more. You really like talking about those British uh, chip AI startups, don't you? Well, it's, it's no good if it isn't British, let's face it. <laughs> Ooh, I thought we're going to get some comments for that. I think one. we probably will, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's something we're definitely going to have to talk on the after show. Let's definitely, yeah. So if you've managed to stay through to the end, we do after shows after every episode. So check the links in the video description and where we have a more free-flowing format to this conversation, especially, you know, those wafer scale engines. We've got to speak about those. We have to talk about those. 